and a warm welcome back to Digital Transformation World Series and this very special spotlight session on going from telco to techco. For this session, I'm delighted to welcome back to the studio Aaron Bozeman Patel. Aaron, good to see you. Thanks, Nick. Great to be back and talk about a subject really passionate to us on the forum, I think. Absolutely. Now, this is based on a white paper that you wrote with contributions from around the industry, speakers and, and contributors from around the world. Talk us through what the focus of that white paper was. What questions is it really trying to answer? Yeah, absolutely. And the whole the whole idea of the white paper is to understand how we go from telco to techco. And that's about, you know, what is that new business case, you know, and how do you use a single architecture and a single approach to IT and networks to launch new products and services quickly, rapidly partner, and then really operate. And this is a really critical bit at the cost point and flexibility that the market requires. So that's all about speed to market, but also making sure that the right cost base is there. Now, you learnt a lot through building this report. We also learnt a lot last week from the opening week of Digital Transformation World Series. CEO after CEO talking about the transformations happening, the need for this transformation to happen. We heard Philip Janssen from BT talking about this aspiration to get to 50-50 between traditional revenues and new revenues. We're seeing that change and it feels like there's motion in the market. Did that come out in the white paper? Yeah, I think it really did. And I think, you know, it's, it's how can we capture that $700 billion, you know, of enterprise uh, revenue. And I think that's what we're all looking at doing now is how can that architecture be flexible enough to allow you to launch new services? You know, as I said, and it's also about how can people understand. So it's about putting that, the, those components, if you like, into business capabilities. And I think that's a real shift in the marketplace. So it doesn't matter who you are, where you sit in the business, you understand what the potential, uh, you know, of that new technology can do and enable you for those revenue models for increasing a customer experience and I think we're starting to see that shift now. We heard it earlier today, you know, Rakuten talking about entrepreneurs and, and taking the operations centre into a customer experience uh, centre. And that is how you're going to deliver these new services and get a bite, you know, out of that 700 billion. Now, big numbers being thrown around. Again, the hype is still real when it comes to 5G. But I think in the white paper, you went a bit beyond that hype into saying, how do we make this really happen? And as you say, hearing from operators throughout this series and partners as well out in the market and what it takes to do that. When it comes to the DNA of the company, which is one of the topics you pick up and in the report, what do you see as the big shifts there in terms of skill sets, talent, uh, new ways of working, and what's your level of confidence? Is that change happening quickly enough? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's happening quickly enough, Nick. I think, you know, this, this, this is always the challenge, you know, it, and it's, it's right, it's about the hype, you know, we talk a lot about it, but really embedding it, and, and I think, you know, you gave, I think as well, one of the great quotes for the white paper, it's about the changing the DNA of a telco, and that's really hard, because DNA is hardwired, you know, and it's something you have to slowly change. I think we're definitely seeing, you know, changes happening, you know, we're seeing the different types of skill sets being hired, you know, Vodafone just hired, for example, 5,000 new software developers, Developers, um, you know, we're seeing uh, you know different different skills coming through, different ways of thinking, and that's what we mean by diversity. When we think about a DNA, you know, it's not just about going from hardware to software. It's about how you think and how you interact with technology. If we think about AI, all the great things that's going to do and the benefits, how do you add that human touch? How do you service that with that enterprise revenue? And some other work we're doing, you know, which, which is building on this white paper, is what does enterprises want from a service provider? And it's actually about a human touch, and that is important in changing that DNA of doing different approaches to business because telcos need to go on this journey from telco to techco to selling solutions, not technology. And that is critical in that DNA. So no longer saying we'll give you so many gigabits uh, you know, per second. You know, It's about what solutions can you solve to my, uh, my business problems. And I think we're going to hear from Anthony uh, in a little bit who's been doing a lot of that at Axiata. Great, great. Well, we're going to welcome our speakers in just a moment. Uh, in the meantime, just to remind you that this is an entirely live session. Uh, so please do bring in your comments and questions on the chat. We'll be bringing as many of those to our audience, uh, our panel of speakers, I should say, as we possibly can. So please do interact with us throughout. Uh, but with no further ado, I'm delighted to welcome four of the contributors to the white paper who uh, are joining us today to really flesh that out a little bit. First of all, Coleman Deegan, CEO of Vodafone Spain. Great to see you, Coleman. And Hi, Nick. Uh, great to be here. Great to see you. Anthony Rodrigo, uh, Group CIO at Axiata. Good to see you. Good to see you. And Mathangi Sindelia, who's a MD for Comms and Media at Accenture. Great to see you. Hi, Nick. Great and to see you. And Jonathan Abramson, Senior VP 
of product and digital at Deutsche Telekom. And I think, uh, Jonathan, you get the prize for the most exciting background there. That's uh, quite a sign behind you. So <laughs> we can guess where you are in the world. So great to see you all. And uh, of course, you're all representing different perspectives when it comes to this at an industry level. We have the CEO perspective, CIO perspective, that product perspective from you, Jonathan, and the partner perspective from you, Mathangi. So looking forward to, to getting into this. Now, Let's dive straight in. The first session uh, of the white paper is all around the search for value. And in the paper, we really explore this in some detail. Aaron shared a few of the headline numbers there. But Colman, I'd like to start with you because in the paper you talk about, and we quoted as saying that we're building the best connectivity for our customers, but growth can only come through opening up services and partnering and embarking on new revenue models. So I wanted to start with hearing from you what those revenue models look like for Vodafone and what you mean by partnering and opening up. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Nick, I would start with a, a kind of a perspective of where we are, and particularly, I would say, in European telecoms. I mean, over 90% of our revenues are coming from uh, connectivity services today. Um, and that market, depending on which market you're in, uh, has varying degrees of competitiveness um, through, uh, you know, a shift uh, to commoditization, to low end, to, to basic connectivity. Um, and I would say in the Spanish market where I am uh, uh, managing uh, with Vodafone, we have a very, um, a very, very competitive connectivity market to the extent uh, you know, most of our customer base are on unlimited tariffs on, on mobile and clearly with fixed uh, through uh, gigabit speed given driven by high density of uh, fiber rollout, uh, fiberization in the market. So we have a quite mature connectivity market, both in B2C and B2B. Um, also, though, we have a very strong uh, digitalization um, a penetration throughout our base and you know we have you know, focused a lot on on digital uh, digitalizing uh, channels uh, go to market activities and that has grown a lot um, and that's given us confidence in fact that you know there is a, a way to go beyond connectivity um, and that's what we've been focusing on uh, in in Vodafone Spain in the last while how can we grow our revenues uh, beyond connectivity and if we break that into b2b and b2c Really, there is a, a big, in, if I start with B2B, uh, more and more uh, opportunities for telcos to participate in things like cloud, uh, edge computing. We have uh, direct access to, to customers, both you know, large corporates, government, right down to Soho, sole traders um, and uh, SMEs, small and medium enterprises. So there are, as these uh, companies uh, begin to digitalize and we digitalize society, and particularly on the back of uh, European uh, structural funds, which are now in the process of uh, being distributed, uh, digitalization of, of society is a big, uh, a big lever. Um, and telcos can play a big part in that, um, in, in terms of uh, connecting uh, the funds to the digitalization of products, so making a strong, uh, bundles and packages with partners around uh, software uh, and upgrading uh, businesses to be future ready and future fit. And that's the journey we have been probably on in our internal operations for the last three or four years. Now we're at the stage where we can uh, generate business models um, and products and services that are not just uh, connectivity based. Uh, on the B2C side, uh, that is uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, more challenging because we're, we're leveraging off a very uh, competitive connectivity uh, field. However, uh, areas around digital channels, if we look at, uh, look at app penetration, look at uh, web penetration, uh, telcos, look at online, offline, omni-channel, uh, telcos are one of the most connected uh, industries in, 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 in any market. Uh, and with, with, the, with great distribution capability. So the move into uh, digital has enabled, opened up new streams uh, going beyond, again, connectivity into selling technology. And if we link that uh, and you know, consumer goods and services uh, beyond, uh, just beyond connectivity, and if we link that to 5G and where 5G is going, clearly uh, telcos have a, a massive opportunity, uh, we believe, to come into that space. Um, and connect uh, customers uh, 
not only for uh, connectivity purposes, but also if we become big in the home, if we can connect uh, devices, sell other uh, products and services now, such as energy, security, um, and even beyond that, into, into tech, uh, into smart technology, which will proliferate more and more. And if we look at all the trends, uh, this is going to be a big area um, going forward, particularly with 5G connectivity and low latency um, uh, through networks, 5G networks. So we're quite um, excited about that opportunity because we think uh, telcos uh, and we think our company can be at the middle of that and drive that forward. So that's how we, we look at it um, and really building from there. Thanks for setting it up so clearly, Coleman. I think that's a vision that we've seen repeated in different operators around the world. And Anthony, let me bring you in here. We heard from your group CEO last week, Dato Ezzedin, about the path that Axiart is on, quite similar to some of the aspects of the journey that Coleman described. In terms of Axiata seeing this search for value, you're already a little way ahead in terms of monetizing APIs, in terms of building out some of the data assets you have. How do you see this, this value opportunity for operators? Where do you see the, the pots of gold, as it were, when it comes to thinking about future growth? Sure. Uh, just a bit of background, maybe before I uh, ask the question. So we've been kind of working on this API marketplace for a few years, and that will be mainly anchored on uh, your, your 3G and, and 4G network core. I've been talking a lot about uh, the services we create and the developers we engage, etc. But we never talked about what's really behind it. If you peel the onion, um, behind those APIs is really a pretty solid uh, core network and the, the back office BSS systems. So what we've seen is that opening up those back office assets and the core network has helped to generate thousands of services a year via the partner community. Uh, when you when you look down the road with, with 4G plus and 5G, if you're opening only a 10, 15 APIs from the core today, if you look at the 5G network, there's a lot more assets you can actually open up to create interesting services. So what we feel is that uh, with our journey on the API, uh, you know, uh, exposure for the external market that has really scaled up massively, we then brought that back to the, the core, which actually changed the IT organization as a way of thinking. Uh, so I'll give you an idea. Basically, we have about 6,000 APIs open internally, which we use to innovate internally. And, and that momentum will continue to also 5G, where we can actually sort of monetize the 5G network quite a bit. Uh, when you look at the uh, current marketplace, we had a lot of success in uh, in getting into B two C or B two B two C while the partner and developer ecosystem. Uh, what we are seeing now with the pandemic for the last couple of years also is that we are getting a lot of traction on the B two B solutions, especially uh, for enabling SMEs, because when you when you bring down bring down the cost to serve and cost to partner to almost zero, you can actually reach out to the SMEs much better and efficiently. Uh, today, many telcos you know, don't really touch the SMEs because it's really too expensive. But if you bring the cost of serve down to zero, you can actually get to the SMEs much more effectively. We've seen that happening in the last two years in the marketplaces. Jonathan, and you know, I'd really like to build on you know what we said. You know, we talked there about the value, but one of the best things uh, I really enjoyed talking to you about was about you know realizing that value. And, and the next part of that was for you to say, you no, know, it's no longer acceptable for the commercial and business teams not to have a basic understanding of you know the IT and the architecture principles. And it was the same that the IT teams must understand again the drivers of that commercial business. You know, how are you addressing that to realize the value of which you know just Coleman and Anthony uh, spoke about just then? Yeah, interestingly, uh, in, in the ASEAN case, cool the API one, business actually um, got started the, within. It comes very much down to the hiring the right talent and, and having the right sort of capabilities within the organisation. This is something that has been a bit of a journey for us in telecom over the last years. Um, I was just finishing up on a workshop uh, with our colleagues in Poland uh, and getting to a point where, I guess, reflecting on that conversation now where I have the CTIO uh, talking about customer journey mapping and the CMO talking about IT architecture is a beautiful thing uh, from, a, from a product point of view, getting to the point where we have uh, technology and commercial colleagues finishing each other's sentences is ultimately really where we want to end up. This is unusual in uh, the telecommunications industry, but this would not be uh, unusual in, in the OTT space. So really, 
uh, that transition on on capability uh, building within the organisation and hiring the right talent is is a core component of driving to that outcome. Yeah, I think I think that's critical. I mean, Mathangi, are, are you seeing this approach, you know, across? I mean, Nick, and this is something that's really interesting, isn't it? You know, I mean, for you, Mathangi, is everyone taking the same approach, or have we still got a bit of a way to go? But but I also do agree that we still have some way to go. Uh, I, I mean, we, we need to think of it holistically. It's it's not just about uh, about technology, and and you just can't. Uh, I think Nick, you had a, a great goal. You you can't have a Ferrari in a Lada. So it, it just isn't about changing the technology. And and to Jonathan's point, um, it, it really has moved quite a way um, across the, across organizations. But we do have a long way to go. It's it's about the mind sh mindset shift. It's about um, the operating model change. It's it's about technology reinvention, and it's also about identifying that uh, that right business model, right? I mean, getting to the adjacency and understanding the right business model that that you can then create those solutions and and not just uh, not just connectivity. So so it's still some way to go, of course. Now, Anthony, I saw you nodding along there. Uh, this resonates with you as part of the the change that needs to happen. Absolutely. In fact, uh, Nick, uh, we started a program called Take Back Control a couple of years ago, where we realized that the talent and, and the skill internally was not enough to scale the IT and the ecosystem as we required. So we began a, a, a separate program to actually build that skill in-house. So we now have a thousand plus people entity created just for that, where they focus on digital skill development and uh, software development skills. And that has really helped us not only accelerated go-to-market speed, and as well as bring down the cost to serve tremendously. And, and that's helping actually fuel the IT transformation internally quite a bit, actually. Very clear. Now, when it comes to this actual transformation, Coleman, Vodafone's been pretty clear about this migration to being a tech co, which the other speakers just spoke about there. These are nice buzzwords, but what does being a tech co really mean to you as a CEO? How do you know you're there and how do you measure the journey? Oh, uh, yes, uh, quite a lot of buzzwords. I think we're in a big, big transformation. And uh, I, I, I was just reflecting on Anthony's comment, take back control. I think if you look at the composition of a telco today compared to where it was a few years ago, and even project where it's going to be in another few years, you'll see, you're going to see radical uh, differences um, in terms of the amount of uh, IT capabilities that will reside within the company. Uh, maybe a, a strategic mistake uh, as, an, as an industry we made uh, some years back was to uh, outsource heavily IT capability, which constrained the future uh, flexibility, particularly coming into a digital age, um, 4G, 5G technology. So uh, the one measure, is how many of uh, of our resources are are going to be uh, within the company? How much technology are we developing ourselves? How much uh, of uh, reliance or dependence will we build and build that capability on, you know, on products and services uh, that will give us that we will be self dependent? Uh, that's a, a huge thing. Um, I think from a business perspective, uh, more and more you're going to see. Uh, you know, how much of uh, revenues are coming from core business, core connectivity, and how much are coming from beyond core connectivity. Um, and, and that is going to be a metric that will uh, be more and more uh, reviewed, I think, uh, going forward, um, uh, particularly as it, as it gains scale. Um, and then other things, I mean, on the journey, uh, for example, how many uh, customers, users are using your digital channels uh, because digital will be a key enabler, a key driver of, uh, of, of beyond connectivity because in the end, uh, while we will present a, an omni-channel approach, uh, it will be driven through digital, digital products and services um, uh, as, a, as the, the, the key way. And, and the, the difference this time, uh, the, maybe in the past, is that we will probably have more of a control on the customer experience, on the technology itself, how you're developing it. Um, and uh, that's an exciting thing. I, I, I really believe we're at a, uh, a stage in, in development where technology is super uh, enabling. Um, I mean, we can do things today we couldn't even dream about even five years ago in terms of our businesses. Um, the holy grail uh, for marketing has always been 
always on uh, contextual personalized uh, marketing in omnichannel it exists today uh, that didn't exist five years ago and that is on uh, it's now becoming more and more uh, uh, successful to the business or more and more driving our business if you think about uh, artificial intelligence machine learning uh, improving the, the the quality of the the contact with the customer and that is something that telco has that many many other industries doesn't they don't have uh, the the customer data the contact they connect with the customer our customers are very loyal and they trust our brands so we have a uh, the opportunity to uh, come into that space um, and uh, all the while we will be measuring um, uh, the transformation as, as we move along and Nick, that's something that I'd like to, you know, just address because that was another big thing that was talked about in the white paper. And I think, you know, Shankar from Verizon spoke, you know, a lot about those measures, Coleman, I think that, that you're alluding to there, Nick. And I think for me, that's what's so interesting because we talk about the journey to, from telco to techco, but how do you measure what that is? And that's what Shankar was saying, that, you know, that we need a new way of working and what are those new KPIs we're measuring on that journey? And it goes beyond just that revenue because the revenue is the end result of changing the way you work and what those KPIs are to measure. Absolutely. Now, Jonathan, you described the kind of collaboration you're seeing between business and tech teams as a beautiful thing. I think that's a, a good aspiration for us all. How are you seeing this journey to Techco and how do you measure progress along that journey? Is it about teams working together? Is it about innovation? What are the, what are the ways you can measure that progress? Uh, I mean, I think there's, I think the the topic around uh, sort of contribution of revenue from beyond core um, is a is, is an important one. I think that's the as was mentioned before, Aaron, the the the, the outcome or the or the the ultimate sort of um, uh, endpoint that we search for. But we also measure measure obviously customer NPS uh, at a much more granular level than we ever have been able to before. Uh, and things like time to market, I guess KPIs are are, are a great sort of. Uh, uh, set of uh, understandings to get to, to sort of uh, allow us to sort of drive towards that end outcome. But I think fundamentally more as, as an industry today, it's, it's an incredibly exciting place to be. Um, you know, uh, the last year has sort of really proven, um, you know, how important we are as an industry you know, within our customers' lives, both in the B2C and B2B space. Um, you know, we've moved beyond slides uh, and white papers now into real execution. And I think um, what we're seeing now across the industry is, you know, uh, um, you know, and certainly in the case of Deutsche Telekom, um, this sort of abstraction from our legacy and abstraction from our back end and enabling these new business models uh, that will come as a result of that. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, incredibly exciting place for us to be at the moment. Mathangi, are you seeing that as a step change? Do you think something's shifted this year in the pace of change? Uh, I think so too. And uh, I mean, we're seeing a number of examples. Um, um, even the fact that we are... Uh, you know, focusing, as, as Coleman just said, uh, on the small and medium enterprises, which was not necessarily a market earlier, and we're seeing a lot more, uh, you know, options to go reach out to them. Um, one of the surveys that we did at Accenture when the pandemic just started um, was about uh, trust uh, between, uh, you know, especially in the small and medium business sector, uh, between a CSP, a, a telco, and, and say, uh, anyone else, the hyperscalers, for example, and and the and the difference that uh, that the CSPs garnered a larger trust in this region was was so stark, was so stark. It's almost eighty six percent respondents indicated that they would they would be much more comfortable giving their data to the CSPs. That's a huge opportunity, and to the point, has it changed? Has that been a step change in this direction? Now, I think the pandemic has been a, a great opportunity, frankly. For um, for CSPs to to go further down on this on this aspect of trust, and and to your point, if I can just add on to the KPI question that you just asked, uh, beyond the traditional measures, I think we need to think about what could be those um, newer measures that we can think uh, we can start measuring so that you you really are moving along in this whole journey towards the tech go as well, right? As in, are you experimenting more? Are you innovating more? Are there enough failures in your experiment that you can actually uh, take as lessons learned is also maybe a good measure to have uh, beyond uh, looking at uh, what's um, what's just revenue outside of core connectivity and, and solutions beyond that. And are we even going into newer areas? For example, have we made a, 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 a great move towards SMB and the solutions that we can offer to them um, and, and take this, this uh, huge trust uh, difference that we have got as a CSP to, to the next stage. I would say these are, uh, you know, additional areas to look at. 
two great points in there, Mathangi. I mean, that 86% of customers saying they'd be happier if I understood you correctly to put their data with a CSP. That, that seems very significant. And yet, uh, we see customers every day giving their data away without those kind of assurances. So there's a, a, a conundrum there to solve. But sticking with this metric question, Anthony, let me come to you. When you think about the KPIs you use and following that old adage of if you can't uh, measure it, you can't manage it, uh, how are you looking at your team's productivity and how they're progressing on this journey to Techco? How are you measuring that success? If I look at from a uh, beyond connectivity business perspective, um, uh, it's 50-50. So I would say 50% of the KPIs are on the usual stuff, uh, which is revenue, number of transactions, developers, etc. But the other 50% was really around uh, non-technical stuff, uh, engagement. Because we found out that uh, unless you really have a program to uh, actively engage your customers, your developers, and your partners, uh, you can't get the solution to market fast enough or cheap enough. Uh, so we actively measure that engagement piece uh, to ensure the, the production line of services are, are running at optimum capacity. Uh, so that was that was one. And then the underlying that is really around the, uh, the, the uh, team build out. Uh, a lot of the API businesses within the group as yet actually started from within IT. So basically the BUs kind of came out of IT and they become separate, uh, you know, BUs over time. So they kind of have IT DNA, but quickly they realized that technology alone and the revenue alone are not KPIs. You've got to really look at the engagement piece. And, and that's where we really focus on right now, especially, especially in the marketplace development. These are important uh, things to look at. Uh, Matangi also touched, uh, touched on trust. This is a really important piece of the puzzle in a marketplace because uh, you you got to have both the trust of the, the uh, enterprise or the consumer as well as your partner ecosystem. Uh, if either fail, your, your equation, which basically drives your value creation and value capture, pretty much fails. So in the KPIs, we also have a piece to make sure the trust piece also is managed quite well. And Nick, you know, on that, we talk about KPIs and measurements, but what about incentives? You know, and that came up quite a bit, bit in the paper as, as well. You know, it's about how do you incentivize your staff to change and, and to drive those ways? I mean, you know, that is something that's so important to, to build into all your packages and to change that DNA aspect is, is you know, it's how do you bring that change? Is, is, is there a financial reward? Is it, you know, what, what are those ways to do it? I mean, Jonathan, how is, how, how is, how is that happening, you know, for, for you guys? Is it building more incentives for people? Yeah, both for uh, our customers as well as for internally. Um, I think you know we've taken uh, you know clearly measurable and 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 targetable uh, outcomes and KPIs for the internal uh, organisation and and the uh, and our, our staff has been a core component of, of the growth that we've been driving. Um, you know, up to twenty five percent of annual bonuses for our executives in our company are paid based on app penetration. Now, that's a fundamental difference from where the way that we used to operate. Uh, but that really does focus uh, the organization on, on solving through uh, some of the challenges that we potentially had in the past. And it forces people to learn and, 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 and think about new ways of using the tools that we have. So there's a technology component uh, which solves part of the problem. But I think there's also the mindset change that comes as a result of, um, you know, the, way, the, the change in the way that we incentivize um, our internal workforce. Yeah. And those incentives can either be a blocker or an enabler, uh, to your point, Jonathan, if you only change the aspirations and the wishes, but not the realities of what people earn their bonus on, uh, you're not going to get that kind of change. Now, let's, let's move on to another key part of the paper, which was all around the role of having a blueprint for the industry. And TM Forum's working on open digital architecture to help with this, as many other industry initiatives. And Anthony, I wanted to start with you. You mentioned just there the importance of marketplaces to Axiata's strategy. When it comes to having a common blueprint for the industry in the form of a open digital architecture, how important is that to you and, and how, what role does that have beyond just the technology team in enabling you to, to build those marketplaces? Yeah, that was the foundation, Nick, in terms of uh, the, the IT architecture. We, we anchored on the ODA principles three years ago uh, and we got everybody, basically all the opcos, uh, move into that common architecture uh, so that we could start to share software assets, ideas much more freely. So today, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a 
common, if you like an API repo with some 6,000 APIs published across the group. So you can discover new services much faster and actually reuse. So that was a fundamental building block we had to put in place across all the operating companies to make sure that our architecture is consistent, which meant that whatever you create in one offer can be brought to the next one very, very quickly. Uh, now to make that happen, uh, Nick, uh, few things we had to do in terms of uh, the mindset of IT. Uh, typically, people don't want to open these assets up you know, uh, actively. So we had an active program, which was actually linked to the individual person's KPIs to open every possible API you have so that it can be used by the business or IT seamlessly. So the idea was to open these up, not only for uh, you know technical people, also marketing folks, HR, facilities, et cetera. So, so even people in HR or facilities or marketing actually use the APIs without even IT realizing it's being used. So that's the power of an internal marketplace. So once architecture has changed and you open up your assets, this really becomes quite uh, normal behavior. So we've been running it for about three years now. I think we are at scale now. And we've seen uh, very importantly, uh, when you do this, your, your cost comes down by 50% very, very easily because you start to reuse assets much, much faster. Now, Coleman, let me come to you. It might be an unusual question to a CEO talking about architecture, but interestingly, last week, we heard from a number of CEOs saying just how important it is for the business to look at capabilities as reusable capabilities in the business to help everybody understand the sort of previously black box of what was IT. How important is it for you to uh, look at uh, both a common architecture but also a reusable architecture. What do you expect from your technology and business teams in terms of opening up, as Anthony put it, what they might have previously held pretty close to their chest? Well, I feel a little bit embarrassed uh, to wade into uh, with such uh, IT experts and uh, senior professionals uh, <laughs> an esteemed uh, group of people uh, to wade in uh, talking about IT architecture, because it's certainly uh, I'm more than out of my depth. However, let me uh, let me tell you a little bit about our journey and what we uh, what we're seeing at Vodafone. And uh, you know, we have uh, our uh, digital application, uh, my Vodafone app. Um, you know, we have uh, over 20 million users across Europe on that. Uh, but in each market, we have a different instance. Uh, so that is. Uh, uh, something a different uh, back end, a different. Now we've we've harmonised the front end uh, so that the uh, experience is uh, uniform. Now the next step will be to harmonise uh, to just have one platform because, in the end, uh, what we see uh, and it's common across all uh, OTTs uh, that uh, standardisation, that scalability, and Anthony mentioned about the cost to operate, but also the uh, flexibility, agility to bring partners uh, onto platforms, uh, standard APIs. Uh, uh, this is really, really fundamental, uh, particularly in a world where we're moving out of our, our core business, which is also being disintermediated and disrupted uh, as we go along uh, and coming into areas where uh, we need to build scale and we need to utilize scale. So we have large uh, customer bases, very loyal, very trusted, uh, back to the um, uh, you know, to what Matangi had said earlier around, you know, uh, our, our, what our customers feel. Now we need to have uh, technology that enables us uh, to scale up, be very agile, uh, reuse, uh, be very uh, efficient, uh, optimal in how we develop our technology so that we can uh, move to the next level. And, uh, you know, big groups like Axiata, Deutsche Telekom, Vodafone, we're, we're in the same position. I mean, we have... We're, we're dealing with uh, competitors now in hyperscalers who have massive standardization, uh, very uh, uh, you know, new technology, very at the cutting edge. We have to be there as well if we want to compete and into the future. So uh, for us, it's not uh, an option, it's an obligation. Uh, and that's why we have made our changes as Vodafone um, to our organization, our structure and, and our direction of travel. So it's... Uh, it's it's just uh, it's th those uh, debates are over I think uh, yeah. around uh, the, the plat uh, around the power of platforms and scale um, and having common architecture and technology. You bring out a really key point there, Coleman, which is looking at 
Vodafone, for example, but also Deutsche Telekom, also Axiata, not as just Vodafone Spain, but as a collective group. And if we go back a few years in each of those groups, you would have been a, a collection of businesses. Today, you're starting to think in technology terms, in business terms, about your collective power. And we're thinking even bigger in the TM4 about, well, actually, as an industry, to your point on hyperscalers, how do we, how do we collectively compete with some of the new forms of competition coming in? Jonathan, let me come to you on that. How important do you see it for us within a group like Deutsche Telekom, but also as an industry, to be working from a common blueprint to enable that reuse, that rapid experimentation and partnering? Is something like open digital architecture important from that perspective? Uh, it's fundamental. I mean, I think we came at it uh, in Deutsche Telekom uh, from maybe uh, the reverse angle. Ultimately, the key insight that we started with uh, was that building an app, um, uh, to Coleman's point, um, obviously uh, apps are critical um, uh, customer touch points for our customer base. There's no more segmentable, uh, personalizable, real-time communications medium than, than that real estate in a customer's pocket. Building apps isn't difficult, but building apps on a telco stack is actually quite difficult. Uh, and the insight that we had um, is trying to do that 10 times across 10 countries or 11 times across 11 countries uh, across the Deutsche Telekom group um, would have been much more heavy lifting than doing it once um, uh, and having one single code base. That's essentially where the one app platform that we have um, taken a little bit of uh, sort of insight from what's happened within the Vodafone group uh, to deploy in, in Deutsche Telekom. So now um, the self-service application, the one app, um, which is now deployed across uh, nine of our ten countries and will be deployed in Germany uh, towards the end of this year, um, is a single code base developed once and deployed across the group. Now, as was mentioned already, uh, every uh, NAT code that we have has a different OSS and BSS stack. So that abstraction is required. It can't happen without that. Uh, so we need a framework to solve for that. Um, now, which framework better than the TM Forum Open API framework, which is what's been deployed within Deutsche Telekom? So, yes, um, for us to get to this point uh, and for us to have the success that we have now with upwards of 65% of our customer base now opening the app every month, it couldn't have been done if we tried to do that 10 times across 10 countries. It's done once uh, and, uh, and deployed across 10. So we're certainly uh, seeing the value uh, in, in, in the team from standard for that. And Nick, we've got a question from the audience, uh, sorry, if you don't mind, just to, just, to, just to bring them in. I think it, it's building on, on this idea of a common architecture. And so, well, how can you leverage a common architecture to, to, you know, to leverage maybe more regionally sensitive business models? I mean, is, is it enabling you know, greater innovation to do that? I think that's a great question. Yeah, Anthony, maybe that's a good question for you. You're, you're operating across many different markets. So to what extent is standardization helping you actually tune your offerings to the needs of different markets and different customers? Yeah, if I take an example, uh, that might be something useful to explain. Um, when we build an application, uh, let's say in one market, using APIs from one telco, let's say Dialog in Sri Lanka, right? And they may use certain APIs we standardize across the group, uh, whether it is location, uh, DCB, USSD, or anything else, right? Now, once that app is built, let's say in Sri Lanka, uh, and you want to bring it to, let's say, Bangladesh, you can almost take that application wholesale and move it to a Bangladesh market and run that on top of the Bangladesh the Robi infrastructure seamlessly, provided you have the same API signatures as, let's say, Dialog at Robi in Bangladesh. Now, that's happening today in our markets where if an SP develops an application on a, uh, in an API marketplace in one Hong Kong, it can move to the next one very, very quickly. And that's one of the reasons we managed to get some 35,000 apps developed across these markets very, very fast. So it's really fundamental to have, number one, that architecture should be sorted to start with, uh, your, your water line or under the iceberg. But below, above that, the API signature should be pretty much standardized across uh, the marketplace so that anybody who comes and develops anything can be reported very, very fast. Uh, we also found out that when you start doing that, you, the, the stuff you build on top of these APIs, other services, they also can be exposed as APIs back into the marketplace and they can also be standardized the same way. And that actually uh, grows the marketplace exponentially. So it's a, it's a, uh, we talked about KPIs earlier. It's one of the things that we actually measure in terms of how many standard APIs we actually drive across the marketplace also internally as well. Now, 
Mathangi Accenture is in the middle of many of these transformation projects and quite familiar with the standardization work and contributing to that in the TM forum. Listening to what you've heard in terms of allowing us to roll out a dramatically lower cost to port applications and capabilities and products between markets and so on, from your point of view, quite close to some of that integration and so on, how much do you rely on there being a, a global standard and, and where do you think that needs to move to next in terms of opening up some of the growth paths that we explore in the paper? Uh, it, it is absolutely fundamental that we, we get to the common uh, language and, and this being a global standard. Uh, and I think that's that's really what ODA is, is, is going to be solving as well. Uh, I, I mean, if I uh, just take different stages, right, um, at every uh, point in time, and whether it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a change in what telcos are attempting to do, uh, just break down the legacy and and remove some technical debt and move move to the newer uh, B. So it's it's just a change in their uh, in their thinking and and moving to a, a completely new architecture. It's important that we talk of a global standard, or if it's uh, moving to a greenfield business model change and and in that uh, can I start getting in partners and making it really a zero touch partner experience. So to the point that it's not just trust within uh, with your customers but also with your partners. How can I make that simpler, easier? So it's not just time to market with solutions that I am responsible for, but also where I can bring in partners easier. Again, it's a, a global standard that we are talking about. I mean, it's not just internally uh, within different opcos, but it's also with your partners. It's also with what uh, this enables you to get to the next uh, new revenue model and business services. And, and to the point that um, Anthony just made around uh, around each of those individual APIs themselves becoming, you know, uh, a commodity on the marketplace. That's a that's a brilliant idea that that you could you could just um, spawn on and do so many other things with, with, with that reusable component. In fact, one of the, the large transformations that we were executing, uh, one specific uh, measure of success that we undertook as we were defining the, the whole API architecture and the platform was to see how many times we are reusing an API that we have created. Is the entity, um, you know, at the level at which you could reuse in multiple services or are we really creating it uh, too modular that we cannot reuse it and, and hence you need to recreate an, an API and you reduce the number of integration points and, and how, how good was that reuse factor was one of the key measures that we had taken on us uh, to ensure the transformation was, was sustainable. Not just that it was successful, but also sustainable over a period of time and, and your maintenance of these API streams uh, is easy. And, and to that point, again, the global standard is, is critical. Uh, the fact that within the ODA framework, you're also having options to to host and validate uh, some of these is, I think, another great, great plus point. Uh, we don't need to actually implement every component that's available, but actually, but can I can try it, experiment with it, and then move on with if this really makes sense in my context. That's, I think, a, a great plus point as well. So that, to me, is the the next important step. I love more of such experimentation and have more of these software components available for us to adopt and validate before you can really take it to all customers. Yeah, and it, just, to, just to build on a little bit more of that, you know, one, what, one thing that Dr. Lee Huidi said, you know, is that with ODA is actually extending that now to the network layer. How do we get that flexibility and agility into the network? And I think that is the next logical step of what we're doing, spending a lot of time at TM Forum, as you know, on, around autonomous networks and how we can bring that flexibility and softwareization to the network layer uh, as well, which is so, so absolutely. important. Absolutely. Well, We've talked a lot about technology there, but I want to just take us a step back for a second because it's easy to get lost in the technology and as an industry, sometimes we do that. Let's talk a little more about the people side of this because ultimately we all know we can fix the technology, the, the people change is harder. And Coleman, I'd like to start with you in terms of the, the DNA we talked about a little earlier in this session. Uh, we've already heard from the rest of the panel and yourself on that need for your business colleagues and commercial teams to understand the tech better, your tech teams to understand the the commercial side better. In terms of changing the operating model in a, in a company like Vodafone, how is that shifting in the last few years? And do you think it's changing fast enough as an industry? Well, I think, uh, Nick, we've made a, a significant uh, shift um, uh, three years ago or four years ago, if you'd have mentioned uh, words like tribes, squads, 
agile, um, uh, you would have had a lot of confused uh, uh, faces around the table. Now it's fundamental. So our commercial teams um, uh, were embedded uh, with uh, our IT colleagues um, and we we're scaling up very fast. And even in, in, in Vodafone Spain alone in this year, we will bring in an incremental 75 IT engineers, uh, 75 commercial people into our, into our squads. It's a significant part of our business. Um, I am sure in, in three years' time, we will have more people working in commercial and uh, IT uh, than we will have in other parts of, uh, other part, a part of the, the agile framework than we have in other parts of the business. So this is uh, on, the, on the digital transformation of the company. Um, so that is uh, that, that is uh, moving quite fast, I would say, and uh, and penetrating very much into what we do. I think if you look back at the history of, of what a, a telco or how a telco was set up, uh, probably uh, very strong network experience, very strong um, technology um, in that way. Whereas on the IT, mostly outsourced uh, um, uh, across the industry. Uh, that is now changing very, very fast. So we have, um, uh, and the, the methodology, the ways of working are changing uh, very, very fast, uh, bifurcating uh, uh, your digital capabilities from the core stack, from the legacy architecture we have moving very, very fast. As I said before, I'll say it again, uh, technology enabling um, uh, you know, amazing uh, capabilities and enabling ma major steps forward in how we run our business. Cloud-based uh, BSS systems, uh, open source architecture, and, and the exciting thing is all being de developed by our own people, by our own teams. Um, I mean, Vodafone itself, in, in the country where I am, in, uh, we've launched uh, an initiative now, 600 uh, roles uh, coming into a, an IoT center of excellence in Malaga, based in Spain. Uh, and that will grow, I'm sure, uh, as we develop our own technology, um, build our own platforms and systems going forward. So, the uh, I, I think from a capability perspective, we're on a we're on a track. We're on a track. Um, uh, what uh, what we look like today is not what we looked like three years ago, and for sure won't be what we look like in three years' time. And that is the evolution to a tech company. Um, and then uh, the products and services. Uh, the experiences being delivered uh, by uh, telcos um, will radically change. Um, and that's for sure. As we come to common architecture, as we come to build uh, platforms and scaled uh, uh, approaches to how we address our customers and the experience we give our uh, customers, which will be more and more in our control uh, as, as companies and how we deliver those, um, you, it's, it's really going to be quite transformational. And uh, I don't see any uh, way back or any anything that would deviate from that. Um, so we, as I said, if we have this conversation in three years' time, I will be uh, talking about a, again a completely different company or a different shape of a company than where we are today. Now that pace of change is quite dramatic. Uh, if we compare the last three years to maybe the last twenty or thirty in terms of way of working, it's a more fundamental change. Critical to that, though, is our level of understanding of the customer. And you mentioned it a couple of times there, Coleman, in terms of really focusing on those customer needs, translating that into technology. And if we're honest, as an industry, it's not something we've been great at. It's perhaps not something we've needed right. to be that great at, but we do going forward. Jonathan, when you're thinking about future products and services at Deutsche Telekom, how are you driving, starting with a customer, into those ways of working uh, for teams that may not be used to doing that in the past? I think um, the digitization that we've been doing of our BSS, which I think Colm was re referring to before, which is a journey that we're also on, is, is a big part of that. Um, and I, I think what that does organically is it um, uh, spurs uh, inspiration within the teams and gives people uh, within the organization um, uh, inspiration for, for which to then go and build things on top. Um, really, the focus uh, for us, and you know, I think if we look at any uh, strategy document from any telco around the world, uh, bringing customers to the core of everything that we do um, is a core component of that. And that's certainly no different here in Deutsche Telekom. What's different now uh, and what uh, these new technologies and capabilities solve for is the, the ability for us to measure uh, and uh, predict 
uh, and then uh, take interventions at a scale uh, and at a, at, a, at a granularity that's never been possible before. Uh, and I think those things very much support the growth uh, of, of sort of customer experience within our core products, but also spurn uh, and, and, and spin off uh, an opportunity to sort of for us to grow beyond core. It's a happy coincidence that uh, the same capabilities that we need to expose on these APIs that have been referred to so often um, on this call uh, around um, in enabling our front end systems, our applications and our, and our assisted channel uh, front ends, customer profile, billing, behavior, segmentation, um, uh, you know, customer preferences, customer usage experience, are uh, things which drive our core services and our core platforms and our core touch points, but also at the same uh, uh, capabilities and the same sort of uh, endpoints, which can be harmonised and then exposed beyond the core for uh, you know potentially non um, non telco uh, you know, partnerships that we now look towards uh, developing. So I think uh, yeah, certainly this transformation is, is 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 driving value both into our core business, but also beyond uh, as we look forward. And Nick, we've got, we've got a question uh, from the audience, and thank you, do keep them coming in. Uh, this is from uh, Shabanka Chandra, and I think it's interesting that we're talking about customer experience, because this is a question, you know, that we, that we often get asked, you know, if everything's getting standardised in telco, what are those new parameters we're going to be judged on? And, you know, and customer experience is a good example of, actually, that's something you can differentiate and have a different, you know, a different angle. Absolutely. Mathangi, what are your thoughts on that? Um, and I, I would just step back and say, uh, when you say customer experience, I think we should also think about um, the unified experiences that we want, not just in a B2C space, your end customers, but also in a B2B, um, right? I mean, the expectation on customer experience has, has now been changed even for enterprises. A lot of the opportunities that we're seeing even in the B2B space is, is really about improving customer experience. Um, I, I mean, the example that's called out even in the white paper around, um, around the wholesale transformation that STC did uh, is about how much uh, reduction they, are, they achieved in, uh, you know, the timing for quotes and, and so on. That's, that's critical in, in terms of making it easier for customers to, to interact with you. At, at the end of the day, it's about uh, understanding really the needs of the customer, irrespective of whether they're an enterprise or, or the end customer, and how can you make, um, make relevant uh, recommendations, choices, and, and easy to, to do business with you. So I think that's, that's become critical. And, and if I just extend this uh, with 5G and, and the whole opportunities around, uh, I mean, I, I just heard about uh, the whole IoT center that uh, Kuru was talking about in Malaga. The opportunities around I, IoT and the opportunities that, that telcos can play in the cross-industry sector with 5G is again immense. And, and there, there also, there needs to be a, a critical focus on what really the customer is looking for. Is it, uh, is it about, uh, you know, low latency in, in the field of um, uh, health and medical supply chain, for example, or is it about, about understanding the importance of um, uh, the sensor information that you get in a mining industry and so on. So understanding the customer, the context uh, is critical, whether it is, uh, a B2B or a B2C space, and a lot more with this opening up with 5G. Thanks, Mikai. Thank you. Now, um, Anthony, let me come to you on that question. Making that real in terms of not only understanding the customer, but having the capabilities to, as I always think of it, go and meet the customer in the morning, come back to base and think about how you can actually address those needs. For Axiata, how are you bridging that gap for what would have been traditionally a very waterfall style requirements process, deciding what you can engineer. In terms of translating and even helping customers understand what the technologies can do for them, how are you training your sales team differently? How are you training your, your go-to-market teams differently to address that? Yeah, I think a couple of things here. Uh, in terms of the organizational transformation, we've seen that happen over Seattle over the last couple of years, where we've kind of uh, embedded IT and, and business folks into you know single agile teams. So that that edge is actually seeing the customer interactions and customer sentiments real time. So they can actually feel that and then take action almost real time. Uh, Nick, I want to kind of comment on uh, when you say customer experience, we typically talk about the consumer and uh, more lately about the enterprises. Uh, when it comes to this marketplace type approach, what we forget is the, the partner experience because you, you really want to make sure your, 
your your partner experience on the supply side is superb. With the, these uh, real time dashboards they have on your revenue and uptake, etc., customer sentiment and analytics, uh, those should be actually at a level five. Uh, and what we are seeing today is that we have not actually spent too much time doing that. We mostly focus on the customer, the B two C or B two B, not the B two P. So we are now working on that as well. I touched on this earlier as well about building trust on both sides, on the customer side as well as the partner side. So in terms of the partner experience, that trust piece also can be built out with it if you have super customer experience to the partners. So in terms of the operational mode, I think that what we have uh, running right now in terms of all structure and the, and the execution mode, that IT and biz mix at the edge has really helped us solve that problem to a large extent. That, that's a great additional point, Anthony, on that customer experience with partners and the different relationship with partners as well. Now, we're, we're just coming into the closing part of the session, but I, I couldn't let you go without asking you a question on, as we're at a collaborative event for the industry and as a collaborative industry body, your expectations of where you think industry collaboration is going to be critical to this future we've, we've mapped out in this session. So, Mathangi, maybe I can start with you. When you think about where industry collaboration is going to be most important, over the next few years, where would you highlight and where would you like to see more focus? Uh, I think um, uh, structural separation is probably one area uh, where we should uh, seriously think about this and, and also identifying those, those new areas where um, assets can be um, can be shared, uh, which is one area which I think we could do a lot more as an industry uh, in terms of collaborating. And the other would be uh, just opening up and, and thinking about partners as, uh, I mean, truly partners and not just a vendor relationship, uh, be it uh, in the IT space or be it in, uh, you know, the larger ecosystem and, and providing services uh, along with them. I think that's uh, a critical uh, change that we need to do as an industry, collaborate uh, much more with um, with the partners as well. Thanks, Pathangi. Jonathan, let me pose the same question to you. Yeah, I think um, maybe uh, myself and my colleagues in the technology and product space probably don't look at competition the same way that our commercial colleagues do. Uh, so I think uh, cross collaboration, cross collaboration um, across industry and, and uh, um, even within the industry, I think is core to, to what we can be solving for going forward. I think if we look into new business models and the need for coverage across the base, things like uh, advertising models and the like, uh, loyalty models, I can really see that uh, collaboration and partnership um, across the industry, even intra-country, um, is uh, potentially a, a huge uh, value that can be unlocked from a customer point of view where they don't really want to be uh, sort of interacting or integrating more than once. Uh, so that so that, that sort of harmonization, I think, gives us a huge opportunity for, for future revenue models, which we haven't uh, really had access to up until now. Very clear. And Anthony, I'm going to come to you on this importance of collaboration. What, where do you want to see more collaboration? Is it in the marketplaces area you've talked about or something else? Yeah, I think it does touch on what Matangi mentioned as well. Uh, in terms of asset sharing, that would be a really great help if we can do that seamlessly. Uh, and the second point is around the marketplaces as we move into 5G. Uh, many services there actually link to interoperator cooperation. So if you can interconnect those marketplaces, that will be really tremendous. I think there are a lot of marketplaces out there with different telcos, but they're not interconnected. So if you have a standard to kind of connect these to some level, that will really help to uh, you know take off on 5G services. Very clear. Thanks, Anthony. And Coleman, I'm going to give you the last word on this in terms of industry collaboration and perhaps expectations of, of industry bodies like TM Forum. What are you, what are you looking for over the, the next couple of years? Well, clearly, I think um, uh, bodies like TM Forum have a huge role to play, uh, Nick, in terms of uh, harmonizing standards, uh, particularly as you move more and more into digitalization, um, into, you know, uh, you know, around vendor ecosystems or partner ecosystems having common uh, uh, standards of how you, let's say, plug in and plug out of uh, systems. I think uh, Jonathan mentioned it well, you know, can we think of areas where cross collaboration particularly coming into 5g um, and uh, with low latency uh, connected uh, millions uh, billions maybe of connected devices how can we leverage that as an industry rather than uh, maybe allowing you know hyperscalers or or other over the top uh, players to you know to 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 take that space uh, there will be new opportunities, I'm sure, commercial opportunities. And then the final area, which I think uh, is moving on 
quite well but around the area of regulation of course uh, telcos were heavily regulated um, um, so in the digital space in the, the going forward how can we uh, work together uh, to you know provide a, a fairer or a level playing field against uh, maybe unregulated uh, or less uh, less less overviewed um, competition because that will uh, if we can do that right, that can uh, rebalance a little bit the, the future um, and the future competitive playing field. That gives us a very clear remit, Coleman. Uh, with that, we're out of time, but uh, a final word of thanks to each of you, Coleman, Anthony, Mathangi, and Jonathan. Thanks for joining us and thanks for being part of the white paper. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. And that uh, closes our session for today. Uh, the white paper we've been referring to is available uh, through the TM Forum website. There'll be a link in the chat as well. Uh, whether you're joining us live or on replay, thanks very much for being part of Digital Transformation World Series, and we'll be back very soon. <laughs>